Well, friends, uh, thanks uh, for being here this morning. Uh, hey, listen, welcome to week number two of our brand new sermon series called Jesus Quest 15, JQ 15. Uh, we're hoping that what we're doing is taking you, taking us together into a deeper understanding about who Jesus Christ is, because this is so like uber important. This is so amazingly vital to who you are. We're going to talk about why it's important in a moment, but right now, let's go ahead and take a look at the screens. Let's jump into our sermon by watching this video. Anybody who know me will know that after today and yesterday, my life has changed. Before somebody calls me to give me something, I have to hit me. I can't hear. As a young man like this, Saturday morning, I came to Accra to visit my own brothers. And the train left. I was very late and the train left. So I just went and slept at this place. I was sleeping like I'm sleeping. Ah, I heard my, he, one, my ears sound. If any man be in Christ, he is a new creation. He changes us from the inside out. I wake up, I, plenty of people was. I say no, I will talk because I, 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 I am healed right now. And I was healed, that Im immediately I was healed. I heard that you were deaf in both ears for two years, is that true? Uh, I, my name is Mohammed. I said, from Mohammed, I I came from Tema, I came to Kanisi. By going to take a train, I make late. So I say, let me come to the Independence Square, you see? I came to Independence Square. I was sitting down here, just here. I did not even pray. I did not do anything. So I, I wake up and I, I, I can hear, and the ears was telling me I can hear. People who know me can testify that I am very happy. The, even the Quran tell me that if you are a Muslim and you do not believe in Jesus Christ, you are not a Muslim. You are not Muslim. So I, I believe that it's like that. When you, you know the truth, and the truth must surely set you free. Let me tell my wife that Jesus is the Son of God. And let me tell him that I am him. I have to appreciate and to thank Jesus for what he has done for me. If I have opportunity, I could attend to pastor and then I'll open my own church. Or I'll be preaching in the street, telling them and read this and read this, telling them to understand that we are all the same people. We don't hate each other. I don't hate them. I don't hate Christian. I don't hate Muslim. But I need to worship the truth. That is what I mean. But I received my healing. And I believe only one thing, that only if you have belief that Jesus Christ is the Lord and the Savior, then the truth shall set you free. And you will get life, even here and after death. when I first saw that video, I was a little bit concerned because I couldn't tell if he gave his life to Christ or he was still a Muslim. I, I, was, I was unsure. And so we did a little bit more digging and went back and watched the raw video, you know, it wasn't doctored up and, and I read the, um, the blog post of the, the evangelist pastor that was there. And it seems like this guy really didn't give his life to Jesus Christ. Um, he, he, and the things he said, by the way, are so radically opposed to what a Muslim would believe. And we'll talk about that a little bit later. But whether he gave his life to Christ or not, what that video did for me was, was it, it, it kind of centered this. It, it put in the crosshairs the question that who is Jesus? I mean, if a Muslim doesn't believe in Jesus, then he's not Muslim. But they believe in Jesus in a radically different way than we believe in Jesus. So we have to begin to ask ourselves uh, again, who is Jesus? And that's the whole point of this sermon series 
There are a lot of people from a lot of different world religions that, that believe a lot of different things about this. But what about you? Because this gets very personal. And it has to be very personal. Who is Jesus? This morning, let's take another step in our quest to discover who Jesus really is, of who, who you believe him to be, because it makes every difference in this world and the world to come. Let's pray our way in. Jesus, you have set the stage. You've shown the world who you are. And God, we, we've missed it. We've taken part of it. We've, um, we've missed who you are. And we don't want to miss you anymore. So God, today I pray that as we gather in this place, we would not only hear your word, but we would have a fresh encounter, Jesus, with you. That Lord God, uh, indeed the deaf would hear, the blind would see, the lame would leap for joy. That the spiritually dead would become spiritually awakened. And we would begin to live, Lord God, so differently that, that everything does change. That when we encounter you, the risen Christ, Jesus, our God, that we would no longer be the same from the inside out and from the outside around. That we would go back into our homes and into our neighborhoods and into our workplaces, into our schools, and we would be agent, agents of change because today we have, we have met the risen Savior, Jesus Christ, and we have become believers in who you really are, that you are God. So Jesus, may it be so. God, show us. Show us today who you are. We pray this, Jesus, in your holy name and all of God's people said, amen. amen. Now, friends, I know, and when we did this last week, um, if, if you weren't here last week, we're going to catch you up as we go along. But as we dig into this Jesus Quest 15, there are uh, some of you who may want to dig deeper and you might want to have some resources to do that. So I've listed some books on screen for you that I, I would recommend um, to put on your shelf and more importantly in your hands. But Philip Yancey, The Jesus I Never Knew, great book about the identity of Jesus. Uh, Lee Strobel, The Case for Christ, if you've got someone in your life, or maybe you personally, you just really need to know that Jesus Christ is who he says he is. What does he say about himself? Um, that's a great book. I'd, I'd put that in your hand any day. Max Lucado, God Came Near, super easy book to read. Uh, gets into a really good um, take on who Jesus is. Josh McDowell, not an easy read. A uh, big, thick book that would take you about five years to get through. But if you know someone who just needs like the empirical evidence, um, he's done all the homework. That's a great, thick book um, that I would suggest to you. Josh McDowell's also done an easy little um, paperback, more than a carpenter, and that really boils it down. That's a great book to gift to people. You can buy those oftentimes in bulk. So I suggest those, those books to you. You know, so often we talk about who you are in Christ. So often we talk about who your identity is in Christ and how fact, fact is that's really super important, and it is. But this morning, our identity, Christ, is, is not who you are to Jesus, but who Jesus is to you. Listen, there are different starting points, um, but this has got to be one of the most important starting points. If you miss this, you're going to end up somewhere far away from where God wants you to be. If you miss this, if you miss who Jesus is, then the rest of your theology and the rest of your neology and the rest of the way you live your life will be radically altered from where it's supposed to be. There's a plumb line that's been set that Jesus has given us about who he is. And if you veer off from that at the very beginning, even a little bit, then down the line, your feet off and maybe miles off by the end of the day. So we want to make sure we get this right. This, this is a point we made last week. How important this is, is who you believe Jesus is will drive the way you live. Who you believe Jesus is will drive the way you live. Listen, if Jesus is only a man, only a prophet, only a teacher, only a sage, if Jesus is only human after all, then you don't have to agree with him, right? We, go, we, we, we live that way every day. I love my parents, but they're only human after all. I respect my teachers, but they were only human after all. I really respect the role of our president, but he's only human after all. The moment we say, oh, but someone's only human, we've just opened up a gap that gives us the ability to disagree with them. Mom and dad, I hear what you're saying, but I'm not going to live my life that way. Teachers, I understand what you're saying and teaching, but I don't agree with you. President, I understand what you're doing, sort of, but I'm not going to agree with you, right? Uh, so there are, I'm not, I'm not being political, I'm the most least political person you'll ever know. But the reality is the moment we say someone is only human, then we've just given ourselves room to live differently than what they would say or, to us or teach to us. But to say that Jesus is God 
You've just eclipsed that room to disagree because our definition of God must be the one who is the supreme authority, the only authority over and above everything and everyone else. And so if you say, well, Jesus is God, Jesus is that God who is the authority over everything, including me in my life, I, I no longer have any room to disagree with him because he is the authority. What he says goes no matter what. Now, you can reject that. He gives you the choice to reject him. But you cannot disagree with him. You can walk away from him, but you cannot make him into less than he is, although that's often what we, we try to do. That's what we learned that this caused a big debate in the early fourth century. There was a church leader named, named Arius who began to teach that Jesus is not God. He was just um, created by God. He believed that Jesus was not eternal, not infinite. He didn't always exist. And this caused a, a big debate. So a council was, was called. Emperor Constantine called all the, the major players, all the church leaders together to a little town called Nicaea in what's modern day Turkey. He said, we're going to get this thing straightened out because this is impacting the church, which was you know, pretty much in, in that empire, the known world at the time. So we're going to make sure we get this thing figured out. So they, they got together, they put their brains together, and they began to look at um, all the biblical, historical, and theological evidence to clarify who Jesus is. And man, they came out of that with a rock-solid statement, a statement of belief, a creed. And since it was done in Nicaea, this creed, they named it the... Nicene, sharpest tax, that's great, the Nicene Creed, yeah. Then this is the one that whether you come from a Catholic church, a, a Protestant church, not a non-denominational church, this is the one creed that we all use and all agree with most uh, of all the creeds we have. From 325 AD there in Nicaea, we have this, these words that define the Christian faith. The early Christians, they stood up and said, no, this is what we believe is right and accurate about the identity and the divinity of Jesus. What I'm going to do is put on screen just some of the opening lines. I'm going to ask you to read these words with me. Remember, these are ancient, and yet they're still used in all of our denominations today, mostly. Read these words with me. We believe in one God, the Father, the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all that is, seen and unseen. You've just separated yourselves from nearly every other major world religion. You've just distinguished yourself from almost every other major world religion. Most other world religions either have a bunch of other gods, or they have Mr. and Mrs. God, or they believe in some way you and I are all God. That's not who we are. That's not what Scripture teaches, not what we believe. Only a few claim there to be one God, and so we've just distinguished ourselves from most other world religions. Let's keep going to see what else they had to say. We believe in one Lord, Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten, not made, of one being with the Father. You've just separated yourselves from everyone else. Even those other world religions that say, yeah, there's only one God, whatever we call him, there's only one God, none of them believe that Jesus is God. You've just made yourself distinct and distinguished if that is what you believe. And that is, by the way, where Orthodox Christianity stands. We are the only ones that believe Jesus is God. Other world religions have a lot of other things um, to say about Jesus. And what I'm going to do right now is give you a, just a, a short list of some of those so that you are aware and so we have kind of a, a framework to build around today. And uh, listen, if you've got family uh, or friends, or maybe you've come out of or still included in one of these other world religions, I'm not trying to offend you. I'm simply trying to put out here facts. I got this from a very um, reliable uh, publishing company that, that publishes these things. Uh, we use them in all of our Sunday school rooms for maps and charts and all, and this is called Rose Company, and they do a great job putting these things out. I've got it from other research uh, from, from Christian groups and companies that I trust to be faithful and fruitful in their ministries. And so let me just give you um, what some of the other world religions believe specifically now about Jesus. Uh, the, the, the religion of Islam, that would be Muslims. Islam is the faith 
Muslims are the people who follow the faith. So here's what Muslims slash Islam believe. Muslims believe that Jesus was one of 124,000 prophets sent by Allah. According to their belief, Jesus was sinless, born of a virgin, and worked miracles. Sounds okay, right? That, that little bit sounds like what we believe. But they also believe he was not the son of God. They believe Jesus is not God and God is not Jesus. He was not crucified. He will come back, but only so he can die as a Muslim. He is not the savior of the world in their faith. That's what Muslims believe about Jesus in a nutshell. Then next, the nation of Islam, which is different than Islam. Okay, those are two different world religions. Officially, Jesus was a sinless prophet sent from Allah. They also believe that Jesus was born from adultery between Mary and Joseph, that Joseph was already married, had a wife, already had kids, um, stepped outside that marriage bounds, had, sex, uh, had a relationship with Mary, uh, and Jesus was born from that adulterous relationship. They do not believe that Jesus was crucified, but rather stabbed to death by an officer of the law, and he is still buried in Jerusalem. That's what the nation of Islam believes. Hindu. In the Hindu faith, Jesus is a respected uh, teacher, guru, even called by some an avatar. He is a son of God among uh, many other sons of God, one of many. His death does not atone for sins, and he did not rise from the dead. That's a Hindu belief. Jehovah's Witnesses may have been at your door yesterday. Jehovah's Witnesses, Jesus is not God. Instead, he is actually the earthly form of Michael the archangel. He lived a perfect life after dying on a stake, not on a cross. His body was destroyed. Jesus is not coming again. He already came back as a spirit in 1914. Soon Jesus and his angels will destroy all non-Jehovah's Witnesses or what many of them or some of them believe. That's Jehovah's Witnesses. And lastly, the Mormons. The Mormons believe that Jesus is a separate God from the Father. Okay, now read into that. A separate God from the Father. All of a sudden, they're not monotheists, they're polytheists. If you go back and read, remember in the, in the Gospel of John, John 1, 1, in the beginning was, was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. They put an extra word in there, in their translation of, of that passage. This is where John is just telling us Jesus is God. The Word, a few verses later, says, and this is Jesus, Jesus is God. Um, but they put in, and the word, the word was with God, and the Word was a God. Again, all of a sudden they're polytheists. And by the way, no other Greek scholar in the world agrees with them, whether they're Christian or not, the Greek scholar. Only the Mormon scholars believe that's how it should be rendered. So they've just added the word. Now they're believing in many gods. And there's a whole lot more on that we can go into. In fact, we're being asked now after last night's teaching um, to maybe conduct a class on Christianity, cultures, and world religion. And so you could look for that. We might be doing that um, summer or fall. But here's what they believe. They believe that um, the father is actually named Elohim, lives on a star planet named Kolab, and Jesus was the spiritual baby of father and mother heaven. He's the older brother of Lucifer, a.k.a. Satan. Um, Lucifer started out as a spiritual baby also. And, and Jesus is the older brother of all of us because we were all spiritual babies of mother and father in heaven also. Jesus' physical body was actually the result of Elohim, the father of heaven, coming down from heaven and having a sexual union with Mary. They believe Jesus was married and that his crucifixion does not provide atonement from sin. That's the Mormon view of Jesus Christ. Friends, there's a buffet of options for you out there. There's a buffet of ideas about who Jesus is Last week, we looked at who the early church believed Jesus was, not just the 325 AD Christians, but we went back even further because we want to get a handle on this. We went back to those who were right on top of Jesus, the first believers, and we, we, we discovered these things. The apostle John, who wrote the gospel of John, wrote the entire gospel with an eye on teaching that Jesus is fully God. You read it all through his gospel. Later, uh, or in the midst of that gospel, we, we listened to Thomas. Remember Thomas, one of the apostles? We, we, after he met the risen Christ, after the, the crucifixion, resurrection, he exclaimed with words and worship, my Lord and my God. He claimed to be God. The common title for Jesus among early church was Son of God. That's how they referred to Jesus over and over again. And this is not like Thor to Odin or Hercules to Zeus. This was a title, not a position. This was a title 
son of God, that actually meant they believed he was God. That's how they thought of him. They were sold out to the fact that Jesus is God. But is that how Jesus thought about himself? I mean, maybe they were just attributing qualities to Jesus that he never asked for. Maybe he, they were giving him attributes he never claimed. Maybe they were defining him in a way he never defined himself. Well, let's find out. What does Jesus say, and, and, and by his words and by his actions, who he wanted us to know he is and was? Just before he went out to the Garden of Gethsemane, where he was later arrested, he was in the upper room with some of his um, closest friends. Remember, the 12 apostles were there. And he just dropped a bomb on them. He just said, hey, just remember, I'm going away. And they're freaked out by that. You can't go away. We need you here. And Jesus said, let me just show you what I'm about to do. And he gave them these words. He said, I'm, I'm going to go away from you, but I'm going to prepare a place for you. And then I will come back and get you and take you to be where I am. And you know the way to where I'm going, is what Jesus said. Now listen now to this exchange between Jesus uh, and, and the apostles. If you've got your Bibles, way to go. John chapter 14, verses 5 through 11. Immediately following that, now verse 5. Thomas, here's Thomas again. Thomas said to him, Lord, we don't know where you're going. So how can we know the way? Jesus answered, I am the way and the truth and the life. And no one comes to the Father except through me. If you really know me, you will know my father as well. From now on, you do know him and have seen him. And Philip chimes in. Philip said, Lord, show us a father and that will be enough for us. Philip was like, wait, 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 wait. I, I, hear, I heard what, um, what Thomas said, you know, we don't know where you're going. How can we know the way? And I don't know, Jesus, secondly, I don't remember seeing the Father anywhere. I think, guys, you remember seeing the Father? I don't, we wouldn't forget that, Jesus. What do you mean we've seen the Father? Listen to Jesus' reply. Verse 9, Jesus answered, Don't you know me, Philip? Don't you know me, Philip? Even after I've been among you such a long time, anyone who has seen me has seen the Father. What's Jesus saying? We're one. The Father and I are the same. We're one. If you see me, you've seen him. Jesus continues, how can you say, show us a father? Don't you believe that I am in the father and the father is in me? The words I say to you, I do not speak on my own authority. Rather, it is the father living in me who is doing his work. Believe me when I say that I am in the father and the father is in me, or at least believe on the evidence of the works themselves. If that's not clear enough, go back about four chapters. Jesus just said it straight out. In John 10, 30, Jesus said, I and the Father are one. No mistakes. The language Jesus used was so clear to the Jews. They got it. They understood it. In fact, John tells us that the Jews tried to kill Jesus because, and I quote, he was even calling God his own Father, making himself equal with God. A little bit later, the Jews were about to stone Jesus to death. So he said to them, I've done a lot of miracles in your midst from the Father. From which of these do you stone me? And here's how they answered him. We're not stoning you for any of these miracles, but because of blasphemy, because you are mere man, claim to be God. Listen, they were listening to Jesus every day, and they kept hearing him say in various ways that he is God. Theologian and professor Paul Little wrote it this way. Jesus was explicitly claiming to be the Son of God. Again, that's a title for saying, I'm God. It is clear that his hearers got the full impact of his words. Jesus claimed to be God. So why can't I? Wouldn't that be kind of cool for me? You know, maybe not so much for y'all, but wouldn't it be cool if I could claim to be God? Hey, guess what? I'm God. Hey, y'all, we're in luck today because, you know, you came to church today and I'm here. I'm God. Wouldn't it be fun, right? What would you say to me in response to that? Well, hey, hey, we know your family, Rich. You know, God wouldn't be such a goofball like you are. Uh, your family's like, they're way better than you, that you see you can't be God. You know, I heard someone else say something else. What, what, what else would you say to me? Prove it. Well, there, I really can't do a whole lot for you. You know, I wouldn't be much of a God if I couldn't prove that I was God, but Jesus did. 
Jesus didn't just make these claims. Jesus backed it up. His words proved that he was God. He displayed God's authority by forgiving sins. Remember that time when Jesus was teaching in a house, and in the middle of his teaching, all of a sudden, like, the roof starts to crumble. And all of a sudden, some light began to show through. And the big, big um, patches of the roof are being torn away because these four guys are lowering their friend who's paralyzed, laying on a pallet, down to get to the foot of Jesus because it was too crowded to come in the door. You remember that? And what Jesus said to him, he said, your sins are forgiven. Get up and go home. And the Jewish leaders were like, whoa, whoa, not so fast, Haas. Only God can forgive sins. And Jesus was like, whatever. If you need me to say it a different way, I'll say it. Okay, sir, instead of what I said before, now just do it this way. Just humor them. Not just are your sins are forgiven, but you are now healed. So get up and go home. And he got up and went home. You know, it's like Jesus saying, hey, I don't care how you ask me to say it. I'm telling you, I have the authority to forgive sins. I can do this because I'm God. Jesus continually displayed that he was God. Jesus judged people. Only God can do that. Jesus raised people from the dead. Only God can do that. Jesus gave people eternal life. Only God can do that. How many times do you read Jesus healing uh, sicknesses, uh, destroying diseases? Again, things only God can do. The people recognize this. They say, whoa, he's claiming to be God and he's backing it up. When they recognized that Jesus was was being God, and they spoke that to him. He didn't rebuke them for that. Remember Peter on the way to Caesarea Philippi, he had this this moment where God, the Father, just said, hey, here's who Jesus is. And he said, you're the, Jesus, you're the son of the living God. You're God. And Jesus didn't say, oh, Peter, don't don't say that. That's not true. He received that as worship. When when the Jews were going to stone him because they said, hey, you're claiming to be God, he didn't say, oh, you're so wrong. Let me just correct you. He said, yeah. I am God. Jesus played the role. He accepted the role of God. Jesus demonstrated power over nature. Remember when he was out in a boat one day and he was sleeping and the apostles that they're, they're, they're in the boat with him, they're like scared to death because they're going to be dead from this storm. It's just swamping their boat. They wake Jesus up. And they say, Jesus, you've got to do something. And Jesus stands up and says, be still. And the wind and the waves were still. And the other men in the boat were like, oh. Who is this that even the wind and the waves obey him? See, Jesus has the authority over nature because as as God, he is the author of nature. Jesus is God. A little secret about me. I love the movie The Avengers. Anybody else Avengers fans? Okay, it's better than last night. We had like three, which was like crazy. But um, are you excited about the new Avengers movie coming out? Yeah, May 1st, it hits the theaters, right? For those of you who are not fans, just you know, tune out for a second. I'm, I'm excited. Who's your favorite Avenger? The Black Widow, because she's a girl, right? And she's really cool, right? Uh, I'm, I'm a fan about the Avengers. I, I can't wait for May 1st to come, next movie to come out. But one of my favorite scenes in the original um, Avengers movie is when uh, Loki, if you don't know who Loki is, he's, he's like the bad alien dude. He's, a, he's the criminal bad guy. And he's sitting there before a Hulk, standing before a Hulk, um, and Hulk's you know, like, not real quick on the uptake. And he says, you should fear me because I am a God. Remember what Hulk does, those of you who've seen the movie? He just takes Loki and he holds him up upside down and says, puny God, and he just throws him away. (laughs) If Jesus can't back up the claims, then he's a puny God. But he backed it up. He didn't just claim it, he actually lived it. And everything he did over and over and over again backed up that he is fully God. Now, does Jesus give us room to believe anything else? Like, you know, there are people who say he was just a great moral teacher. Let me kind of punch a hole in that one for a second. Jesus doesn't give us room to believe anything other than that he is God. Okay, that'd that'd be like you saying, oh, Rich, you're not a husband and dad. Yeah, I am. I've got a wife and kids to prove it. Now, I don't believe you have a wife and kids. They're right, right down there, kids for Christ, and two are sitting right there. Paying attention now. And, um, <laughs> and you know, I don't, I don't give you room to say I'm not a husband and not a dad, because I, I, I am. So if you say that Jesus was just a moral teacher, then that means Jesus is lying, 
And I don't know, my book, Someone Who Lies, is not a good moral teacher, so you really can't claim it to be a moral teacher. Um, he's, he's more than that. Um, what about some people, they say, well, Jesus being God is just legend, something his followers made up to protect um, and promote their cause. Let me punch two holes in that theory for us real quick. Uh, those who wrote about Jesus did so when a lot of people were still living that knew Jesus, that, that were alive when Jesus was alive. And, and they could have very easily said, well, wait, wait a minute, you're telling us Jesus claimed to be God? No, he didn't. I knew Jesus. I was his neighbor. He never claimed to be God. But you know that no one came forward and said, oh, what they're writing is, is false. People who would have known better would have come forward and said, no, Jesus never claimed that. They're wrong. They're making this stuff up. But nobody did. And the last hole punched in that second theory is simply this. Do you remember that a whole lot of people through the centuries have given their lives, martyred for the sake of believing that Jesus is God? I don't know, y'all. It'd be really hard to die for a lie. These people were sold out. These earliest of believers um, that Jesus is God, Jesus himself gave every reason to believe that he is fully God. To know Jesus is to know God. To receive Jesus is to receive God. To hear Jesus is to hear God. To obey Jesus is to obey God. To reject Jesus is to reject God. Jesus did not have an identity crisis. He just kind of calls us on ours. Jesus, he was not confused about who he was. His words and his actions over and over again leave zero room to doubt that he was and is and always will be God. Friends, over the next four weeks, we're going to sharpen our focus. Okay, if Jesus is God, then what is him being here with us for those 33 years? What does that say about God? What do we learn from that? What is Jesus revealing to us about um, who he is as God? And we're going to come in together the next, these next four weeks and really sharpen our focus on some really great teaching um, from Frank and Pastor John and myself. We're going to take some turns over the next four weeks and really uh, talk about who Jesus revealed himself to be as God in human form. And here, here's, my, here's my challenge for you this morning. Um, I'll bet that you know people who don't know that Jesus is God. I'll bet you know people who challenge that. I'll bet you know people who question that. I'll bet you know people who don't believe that at all. So let me encourage you to encourage them to come. These cards are still available at all the welcome stations. We've got a few left. Take them home. Uh, hand them out to people. Say, listen, we're doing this thing called Jesus Quest. And if you want to know who Jesus is, I know you don't believe. I know you might be of a different faith. I know this. I know that about you. Bring your doubts. We're okay with that. You know, it's not us telling you what you have to believe. We're just presenting Jesus and what he tells us to believe. So it's on him. But if you know people, invite them in. We'll set up more chairs. We'd love to have people coming in who really are on that journey questioning who Jesus is. Friends, maybe they're not any further along the journey than you are. Why not bring them? Jesus Quest 15, I'm telling you, nothing matters more. Let me pray our way into what's next. Jesus, uh, thank you for what we've just heard from your word. Jesus, over and over again, you claim to be God. You and the Father are one. And Jesus, if we've missed that, forgive us. Jesus, you just don't give us any room to believe anything else about you. So help us to understand that. And Lord, if we're wrestling with that, if we're grappling with that, Thank you for being patient with us. Thank you for letting us come on at our, at our own pace. We pray that you would move us, Lord God, into that place where we are more fully invested and more fully believing that you are who you say you are. Thank you for letting us bring doubts. Thank you for letting us bring questions. You're not afraid of those things. And I pray, Lord God, that through this sermon series that you would allow us to see the salvation of, the transforming of so many lives for you. Christ, to you be the glory. We pray this in your holy name. Amen.